Hey everybody, Christy Glass here coming to you from Zoomlandia, my favorite land now because I can have anyone I want on my channel at any time. And today's guest is very colorful, vibrant, amazing. I've only met her briefly once in a completely chaotic moment at the Rhinebeck Yarn Bazaar. Please introduce yourself. Hi, I'm Stephanie Lotvin of Telly Bean Knits, and that was a crazy moment whenever we met at the Yarn Bazaar. <laughs> it was like wonderful crazy though. I, I was sorry you, to miss it this year. <laughs> I can tell you had amazing energy and I really wanted to get to know you better, but it was just like one million thousand things going on. And I think the best part of your energy is you were just like, let me work, let me problem solve, which is amazing energy. Yeah, it was a fun, that was like such a fun day. The Yarn Bazaar was so much fun. And I think I had one sentence introductions with 200 people that day. Yeah, yeah. that's how it goes. Well, tell us anything. <laughs> you want to start with what you're wearing because often that's the first people want to know. And then you can tell us your fibers. Story. Yes. So this sweater is actually, um, it's called Bright Axis and it is not out yet because it's one of the new designs for my first book that comes out at the end of the year it was the very first design for the book it was the one that got the book rolling so tell go back to the beginning because you don't just start your fiber story with a book I know you got that's in you got to start at the end right so let's see well I would say I didn't I wasn't one of those lucky girls that learned how to knit from her grandma or her great grandma or my mother um, but knitting was a gift from my mom so I was finishing up my undergrad degrees and I was in the very last semester of school and my mom decided to take me to a yarn shop on a whim, our local yarn shop. I don't even remember what made us go there. Maybe I'm just naturally drawn to yarn. Um, and we went in and it was my birthday. And for my birthday, I said, Can I have a knitting class. Like I'm not a big stuff person. I really like experiences. So I took a knitting class at my local yarn shop and that was my mom's birthday present to me. And it was a three day class and I really lucked out with the teachers. So I had this really wonderful teacher the very first day who said that Elizabeth Zimmerman always said that if you learn to knit first, you hate purling. So she taught purling before she taught the knit stitch, hmm. which was I really think in retrospect, now that I've met so many knitters that hate to purl and so many teachers that despise teaching it, yes, <laughs> that I, it was like the best gift for that knitting lesson. So I started learning to purl. And then on the second day of the class, that teacher was sick. So the, first, the teacher that taught on the first day was a thrower, but the teacher on the second day was not a thrower. So then I learned a totally different style of knitting on the second day than I learned on the first day. And the teacher on the second day said to me, what do you want to accomplish by the end of this class? And I think she was probably expecting like, I want to knit a scarf or I want to knit, I want to just be able to knit. And I was like, I want to be able to read a pattern in a knitting book. Because if I leave here without knowing how to read a pattern, I'll never knit anything that isn't just a scarf. So she said, oh yeah, we can totally do that. No problem. Probably expecting me to find a really cute scarf. I went and bought that book that was so popular, One Skein Wonders. And I picked like a hat with cables that you had to cast on the cable sideways and then pick up stitches around the top of the cable. And she said, well, this is gonna be really complicated, but if you really wanna do it, I was like, yes, that's what I want. I really, really wanna do it. So um, by the third lesson, I had finished the cable and I had picked up the stitches and I was ready to decrease. And she was so enthusiastic about it that it like that joy bubbled over. And I feel like I'm still fueled by that joy. She was like, if you can knit a hat, you can knit anything. And to this day, I really believe a hat is one of the best first projects that you can do. If you can knit a hat, you can knit a sweater. If it fits a head, if you can do decreases, you can definitely knit a sweater. You can knit anything. Because so, a hat is really like a mini body or a too big of a sleeve, right? Yes, it's you have to be able to make sure it fits. But the nice thing is if it doesn't fit you, it probably fits somebody, you know? <laughs> <laughs> so and that's a, a, one of the things I always think about little kids garments. I'm like, well, if I knit it too big, they're going to grow into it. Hats are kind of like that. So at the end of the 
class. I like finished my undergraduate degree. I got married really shortly after I graduated because my husband and I both were ready to move abroad. So we packed everything that we owned and either threw it in our parents' house or threw it into a suitcase and we moved to South Korea and to teach English. So my, my husband is a linguist and I was originally a teacher. So I did English literature, French literature and art whenever I was an undergrad. So I, my favorite place to be is in a classroom with little kids like three to five that don't speak any English. And like, I'd say 20 kids like that, that can't speak to me at all. That's like my dream scenario, <laughs> it's the best place to be. So how do you communicate? Oh my gosh. So anywhere in the world. So I've been really lucky and privileged to teach in Korea and Thailand and Vietnam and France, any place you are in the world, you can communicate with children that have no English because they are just so they're wonderfully honest and unjudgmental or completely judgmental. So you can tell right away, grownups will sit in a room and they'll say, that's nice. And you'll see the like shake in their head, but kids always, and you can tell what the sentences in every language will say, that's boring. <laughs> and you'll be like, okay, time to change course. And so I just, I loved that. I love that. I can relate to that story a little bit because I work on set in the modeling industry with children yes. modeling or acting. And every once in a while, there's a baby who's only been spoken to. The most common is in Russian, actually. Uh -huh. So okay. if the baby's only been spoken to in Russian, I I'm a little bit at a loss for communication. So what I end up doing is just making up a language most of the time. And they just think it's hysterical because they're like, you're crazy, you know? Yeah. And I'll just go for it. And I can usually get them to smile. I mean, that's the whole point. So yes. I can't depend on humor, you know, uh, you know, of the English language, but I can become some kind of weird alien person. Sure. So I can relate to that. It sort of sounds like a fun challenge. Yeah. I mean, when teaching any subject to any age level, I feel like joy is the most important thing. Like you just, that. if you are full of joy, then that joy spills over into the way that any, the subject is understood. So, and maybe, you know, I had little kids in Vietnam who they'd be sitting across the room and they'd be like communicating with their eyes. And then suddenly they'd get up and there'd be like a little fight in the middle of the room. And it wasn't like violent. It was just like, they were full of excitement that day. And it was just like, really need to get that energy out. And we sit back down and we do our dance. And I also really liked that I could dance around and be, I'm pretty shameless in front of children. <laughs> <laughs> well, and also, I mean, that's exactly what you just said about your knitting class is that you felt the joy of this teacher and that's what you keep going back to. And so this absolutely. is the common theme in your life. Yeah, absolutely. So when I moved to South Korea, I was allowed to take two suitcases. So obviously one had clothes and one was completely full of yarn. Obviously. And because I was so new to knitting, I didn't really know a lot of designers at the time. I had heard about Ravelry like a week before I left. And so that was a new idea to me. And I knew the name Elizabeth Zimmerman. So that teacher convinced me just buy all of her books and take them with you when you go abroad. So that's what I did. So that gave me a really like particular viewpoint on what knitting was. I felt like it was so conversational and so organic whenever you were making something. And I remember the first time I knit the baby surprise jacket, when it came together, I laughed out loud. Like it was magic. And so many patterns, once I started exploring that like moment where you're like knitting with a giggle in it, you know, that's, that's what I wanted to do. Like, that's what I wanted to do with my knitting and what I wanted to do with the knitting I was giving to people. And so, yeah, I do think joy has been a thread that's gone through most. <laughs> and I love knitting with a giggle in it. Yeah. <laughs> yes, that's definitely a policy whenever it comes to my knits is knitting with a giggle. So how so, did you get to what you are now? Yeah. Well, I spent two years um, teaching in Korea. And while I was there, I was making friends like Knitting was a way to connect with people, even when I, so my Korean was conversational, um, but I live with a linguist. So I always feel like I don't really speak this language. <laughs> I was doing my best and trying to make friends. And there is not 
at the time that I lived there, there was not like a really strong knitting culture in South Korea. There was a really vibrant crochet culture, which was really exciting. There was lots of influence coming in from Japan and you could find all these beautiful cottons and really neat, I mean, acrylics and very affordable yarns and lots of different colors. And wool was just not something that you looked for a lot while you were there, like just not something that was easily available. But people who wanted to sit around and do things with fibers were, were everywhere. <laughs> so I made friends with the teachers that I was working with um, at my private school. And we would knit together really late in the evenings or crochet together or quilt together. And that was really wonderful. And the two years kind of went by in a flash. We came back home. I reloaded all of my knitting bags, you know, and like ready to go. And then we decided we were gonna travel through Southeast Asia before we got our um, teaching English as a second language certification officially. And so I knew that my husband kept telling me, okay, you've got to cut things. We can only take what fits in our backpack. So you can't have an entire suitcase of yarn for six months. So terrifying as a knitter. So I actually had my first experience with like a real internet yarn update. So I had been only using the yarn that came to me came with me whenever I went to South Korea. When I was back, I was like, okay, what can I take that I'm gonna really treasure and gonna be able to do for a really long time? So I found this yarn company called Posh Yarn and they were the original like post your yarns and then everything disappears in 30 seconds. And so I think I got on their website on their update date every week for five weeks before we left and I got one skein and it was so beautiful. And I decided I was going to knit a really elaborate lace shawl. And the woman at the yarn shop was like, I don't know if that's a good idea for a backpacking trip. That's a very focused project. I was like, yeah, I know that's fair. I might be distracted, but I also can't take a lot of yarn. So one giant lace skein was like the perfect skein and it had all these blues and purples in it. And so every inch was really exciting. So I knit that and now I have that. And I feel like I knit the memory of the trip you know, into every stitch. And so whenever I pull it out, I feel like I can feel the days while we were backpacking through Southeast Asia. And then we landed in Vietnam and we taught there for a few months before we came back very briefly to the United States, reloaded my backpacks, got a whole suitcase full of yarn and we moved back to Korea. I, we missed it so much. South Korea was just the most wonderful experience, teaching experience. It was where my marriage was young and I made so many friends there. And so we were ready to go back. And I was only there for a few months before I got pregnant with my first daughter who is named Telly, what the company is named after Telly Bean. So Cute. I had been, yes. Yeah, so we had been teaching a lot and I, I guess I wasn't really aware of how social my days were, you know, Whenever we were in Korea the first time, I actually taught 52 classes a week. So I would see hundreds of kids in a week. And then when we moved to public school, the school where we lived, so we were in a big city the first time we were in Korea. And then we knew we wanted to be someplace very rural the second time. So my elementary school only had 42 students from preschool to sixth grade. We lived out, it was called Bosong and it's the green tea capital of South Korea. So there was inspiration everywhere and the community was extremely inviting and warm and we got to know a lot of people there and I started working with there's this beautiful tradition in South Korea in this um, particular area where they work hemp fiber from the plant all the way to the finished garment and so I found out that there was a like a communal group outside of my school that was still doing this traditional process with hemp. And the, the finished product was actually made, there were burial clothes that were gifted to in-laws as a wedding gift. And so it was like an older tradition and just so interesting. And so I convinced my one of the teachers from my school to drive me out to the middle of nowhere and to introduce me to the person that was in charge of the group and then he, didn't speak any English. And we were in a very rural area with extremely thick accents. So the Korean that I had was fairly useless. <laughs> and so then he introduced me, but he was so warm and friendly and so 
he really wanted to share what they were doing. So it was a small group of women that were still like keeping this tradition alive, but all of the women were over the age of 80. And they were having trouble like incorporating younger women into the process. And they were just like, the tradition was clearly dying out. And so he, again, was just so full of joy at this. And even without English, like you could feel, I could feel his joy and he could feel my excitement and I was willing. And just like anything else, I'm always shamelessly willing to do whatever it takes to do the fun and exciting and beautiful thing. And so we, he showed me lots of books, books that he'd worked on with museums and books that he was working on projects. And then he introduced me to a woman that lived up over the hill from him. And we made arrangements to, for me to come out every weekend and on Saturdays and work with her, starting with the plant as far as we could get through the process. And so I was only 50% certain that I would, that I was supposed to be on there, be there on Saturdays and that I was supposed to be there in the morning. So I kind of like took the bus and just crossed my fingers. That's the best way to have an adventure is to just hope that what you think is the plan is the plan. <laughs> so we, I, I was correct. I showed up at the right time. The, um, woman that I worked with, she was about 86 at the time. And she was just like, she wanted to feed me. She wanted to show me everything in her house. She wanted to show me things that she had woven. She wanted to show me all the fiber. And it was just, it was glorious. I mean, it was glorious. So we started stripping down hemp fiber. We used um, special stones and tools to like strip the plant material off. We took it out to the like creek at the bottom of the hill to wash it so that it would have a cleaner color. And we got really deeply into the process and then I got pregnant so and I'm terrible terrible at being pregnant I was so sick so sick and miserable and exhausted <laughs> but you know so I stopped going out on Saturdays which I really missed them but they were really understanding they were so excited about the baby and we made sure to bring Telly out after she was born but after I had, there were about five months while I was pregnant with Telly where I couldn't even look at yarn, which was the first time that had ever happened. I was like, the sight of yarn makes me sick. Like the smell of yarn makes me sick. Everything about it. That I happened couldn't. to me too. Really? I was so nervous that I would never knit again. I would walk yes. by my yarn basket and kind of gag. Yes. <laughs> I don't know if it was the lanolin. I tried acrylic. I was like, maybe I'll just do acrylic or like I could find some cotton and everything about it. It was just made me so ill. I honestly think some of it was the movement of my hands. I was just sick. I don't know. I just couldn't knit for the whole first trimester. Yes. For me, it was two, two trimesters. And the third trimester, finally, I got the power to knit back and I knit this like elaborate lace blanket for Telly that she's never used because I'm like, that took me forever, ages to finish that thing. Don't touch that. That's yeah. you, don't touch it. <laughs> I have it stored up for her babies, right? Someday she'll have babies and I'll be like, don't hang out with that. You can't play with that. She mm. pulls it out, it has moth holes all in it. Yeah, yeah, sorry, honey. <laughs> there was a lot of love knit into it though, just, no usage. Oh my gosh. Yeah. Anyway, yeah. keep going. So after she was born, I had gone from, you know, days with lots of students and kids and dancing around to being at home with Telly. I decided I was going to spend that last year because we were in Korea for another two years, spend that last year at home. Samson was working. And so for the first time ever, I was a stay at home mom. I was in a really rural area. And while I did know people, a lot of them didn't have children and they weren't nearby. So I was lonely. Like it was probably the first few months I got really good at monologuing to my baby. I still do that. I just yammer at her. She's like, mom, do you know you're talking to me? Yeah, I'm sorry. It started when you were born and it will never end until you move out. You won't know a moment's rest. <laughs> my apologies. <laughs> so but when she was, my mom was really wonderful. She was so excited to have a granddaughter. You know, we had, there's a, like, we had one more grandbaby in the family at the time, but she was just like, she's like, I'm full of, I'm, I'm rich with grandbabies. Like, so she, and she knew that like some things had been tricky for us to find like maternity clothes when I lived in South Korea were impossible because I'm five foot nine and I, 
my my daughter was nine pounds 11 ounces when she was born so like I was I was big and so there were no maternity clothes I'd like two tank tops and that was I just lived in those and so my mom knew that had been tricky whenever she was when I was pregnant so she thought she said she thought it would be hard to find baby things even though we reassured her that it would not be she sent boxes and boxes of baby clothes to us but I found after a couple of months that I really wasn't putting her in things that were like stiff and ruffly so I started I was knitting for her and I found that I kept I was continually putting her in knitted things that were soft and snuggly and also that you can spit up on and still look dry. <laughs> They're so practical. So I started designing things for her that were not necessarily pink and not necessarily frilly and not necessarily stiff, you know, things that I wanted her to wear. And so that was sort of the birth of Telly Bean Knits was that I wanted to knit things for Telly and I really wanted to have a community on Ravelry or a community online that I could go to and work with and share my excitement while I was still at home with Telly. So that's really where the business was born, was with her. And that's why we named it after her. Because it was, she was, I mean, she was the everything that first year while I was in South Korea. <laughs> Talk about the name Telly. I've never heard that name except for on Sesame Street. Yeah, so it's actually short for Jatel. My daughter is named after her great grandma, who is another part of my fiber story. She's a French Jew and her name is Yiddish, Gittel. And so when she lived in France, it was pronounced Jatel. And so whenever Telly was born, we wanted to name her after her great grandma. And um, because her great grandma has this like special place in my heart, um, and when, but when we were thinking about nicknames and things that would be easy to say and possibly yell, we decided on Telly so that they wouldn't have Grandma, Jatel is actually called Grandma Geet, so they wouldn't have the same nickname. So that way Grandma Geet wouldn't think we were yelling at her whenever we went to visit. That was smart. Yes. And so nicknames are really important to me because I grew up Stephanie in the, in the eighties and nineties, one of usually four or five Stephanies in a room. Yeah. I remember just, and I'm still frustrated by it, that I was named Christina. Mm -hmm. I am named Christina. And so I've never gone by that. I've always gone by Christina. Really? Never. Not once. So it's so frustrating because every time I have to fill out any form or go to a doctor office or anything, they always call me by that name. And I'm like, that's yeah. not me. Yeah. That's not me. <laughs> so I, I understand. So I actually named my kids nicknames period. Like, yeah, you're named the nickname and yeah. that's it. Cause you're not going to go through that. Like I did. So it's so interesting that we have these different points of view on it. I love that. Yes. 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 Oh, Telly so, bean. That's so cute. And it really oh, okay. goes with the joy and the giggles, right? Yes. We're all about the joys and the giggles here. It's really where I start from. And when yeah. you published your first pattern, was it did you sell it? Was it free? Like talk about when you pressed publish, how did that go? I was terrifying to be perfectly honest. I think that, you know, just like most designers, when you get into your first pattern, you don't realize how much you don't know until it goes live and knitters have it in their hands. So I had tested sort of, and I had graded sort of, but I really had like this one little person that I was trying things on and it was such an experience. The knitters were really kind on Ravelry and they were wonderful, like helping to point me in the direction. I clearly needed direction. Like I knew that I loved knitting and I knew that I loved my daughter and I really wanted to do something with other people. <clears throat> so I kind of dove in head first. When I did my second pattern, I had learned so much. The people who had sort of pointed me in the right directions, I reached out to them and I said, would you be willing to test with me? Like let's, because you really, as a new designer, you can't overstate how important your testers are. And as a, an established designer, you, I can't overstate how grateful I am for my testers that I started working with when Telly was six months old still work with me. I have testers that have almost, if not every, almost every pattern in my library. 
and they're just like they're devoted but they give you a perspective that you just can't you can't find on your own and that you probably won't get if you didn't test and put the pattern out live knitters will come to you and say like this looks incorrect this look, looks incorrect but testers are really wonderful about saying like i don't think this is incorrect but i think there's probably a better way to do that and like grading especially grading is a journey like learning to do all the sizes and i think for me it was smart to start with children's wear first because kids are built so differently you know the yokes are shorter there's no waist shaping um you have to think about how big their heads are because they're you know <laughs> they have to fit through the tops of sweaters and um but you can do those experiments with grading and you can do them fairly quickly so with an adult sweater, I might be willing to knit three or four versions of it. With a kid sweater, I'm willing, I'm willing to knit five or six versions of it. At that, in the beginning stages, when I wasn't sure that things were going to work, that's what I would do. And so my second pattern, so the first pattern, I would say it existed. It was on the internet. It was there. And I was proud that it was out. But with the second pattern, I had learned so first pattern. And luckily I didn't get frightened out of it. I think it would have been easy to be frightened away from designing after that first pattern, because it is really like, it, it can be a real blow to your confidence whenever someone says, this is, a, this is an error, but there's no way to put out a perfect pattern. There's no such thing as a pattern that fits every single body that's, that makes every person happy when either in the wording or the abbreviation. So you just have to do your best. And I always like to offer lots of modifications, like as examples of and how you can fit your proportions better. So with my second pattern, I released a pattern called the right is rainbow. And it was um, an unusual yoke. I feel like Elizabeth Zimmerman taught me that unusual yokes were totally acceptable. And so I put out this nonagon, this non nine pointed yoke with lots of rainbow colors in the top of the sweater. And again, it was not perfect. It was not graded perfectly. Like I went back four years later and I was like, okay, time to rewrite this whole thing. But when it came out, it did what I considered to be really well. And the company yarn that I worked with was Spud and Chloe. They reached out to me and they said, we really like this. Could you do some more versions of it? And could we do an adult version? And could you knit the sample in different sizes? And so I did that. And that was, that was really when I got hooked. I was like, oh, I could be collaborating with yarn companies that love yarn and love color and they wanna see their things knit into these new designs. And that was really thrilling for me. That was like the beginning of, ooh, collaboration could be testers and yarn companies and tech editors. And like all of that was really thrilling for me whenever, you know, I'm at home in South Korea with, it's just me and like Telly on my hip while I try to knit and she tries to tear things up. So yeah, so that second pattern went a lot better. And then I think after that, a lot of it was about like the slow slog of improving your craft because with knitting, I felt like I'd been improving my craft like solo by exploring other people's designs. And then once I started designing, it was about improving that craft, making the sizes better, making more people feel included in the design, making sure that, you know, I had standards that I was trying to live up to. And so much of I did that I didn't even realize were going to be factors when I started designing. I made this choice really early. Um, I came, we moved back to the United States because my husband um, started working on his PhD here at um, IU at Indiana University for Linguistics. And I met um, another person who was completely obsessed with knitting named Lisa Ross. And we did, she is a fellow designer and a close friend. We did something that if you asked me to do it now, I'd be like, I can't, that's just too much. But she, she came up with this idea that we should do a one year mystery knit along for children's wear. And every season we should put out a new garment and not like a traditional mystery where every garment came out in pieces, but when you bought the collection, you didn't know what you were getting. And then every quarter you would get a design from Lisa and a design from me, and then we would do a knit along. And working with her on, she had, she was juggling a lot of the same things that I was juggling. And she's such a detail oriented person. 
Um, and I just, I love her sense of color and her enthusiasm for knitting was really infectious. Um, and so like what the excitement that I had before, like coupled with Lisa's excitement made it so that I was just like bursting all the time. <laughs> so we did actually did that mystery knit along for two years and streamlined this, like the way that we were doing our patterns. And I had a much clearer idea of what my voice was at the end of that. Like she helped together. We like, we really set ourselves on a path for what we're doing now. I love all your stories. I didn't know I was going to get so many stories. This is so awesome. But let's fast forward to the book because I want to make sure people see yes. if you have any samples and talk about it. So go. So I want to show you everything from the book, but I've been told that I'm not allowed to by the publisher. <laughs> so that's been the hardest part about the book, actually, is that everything has to be a secret while I'm working on it. And I'm terrible at secrets. My daughter and I have this. So my daughter is five. And since she was three, we've had this deal. Okay. So the rules are, if you have a secret and nobody's supposed to know it, you're allowed to tell it to mommy and mommy's allowed to tell all her secrets to you. And you can tell it over and over and over and over again. Every time you feel like you need to tell the secret, you tell it to mommy. So it works great actually. But then some days she's like, mommy, I got daddy popcorn for his birthday. And she'll tell me like 300 times. <laughs> and that's not an exaggeration like it, but it makes her feel really good. So this year has been a lot like of me talking to my kids about the book. I'm like, isn't this exciting? Look at the colors. And then they're like, yeah, is that for me? And I'm like, oh no, I'm sorry. I didn't hit that for you. They're like, why are you telling me this? So it's not really the enthusiasm that I was looking for about the book. Bummer. So yes. So the book started with an idea that I came up with in 2016 which was the sock arm sweater, which I have sitting here. I love which, the sock arm sweater. Thank you. So I did this sweater, it's kind of wrinkly, no judgment. So I did this sweater with mustache yarn in 2016. So with the really simple idea that I had all of these spelt striping yarns that were so fantastic. So they would, sometimes they were yarns that, you know, honestly, I spent more money on them. And so I didn't want to put them in my shoes. Like, or the colors were just so fantastic. Like I had such yarn pride whenever I would finish knitting them, I would finish socks. And I just want to like walk around and be like, guys, check this out. These are amazing. Talk ear. And it's, yes, exactly. And instead you put them on your feet and you put your shoes on and there'd be like, a half an inch between my pants and the, my shoe. And that would be the only thing you would see. So I reached out to Stacy at mustache and I was like, I have yarn in my stash. I really love it. Can we knit a sweater? And I think she didn't know me at the time, but she was, she's just a very generous person. She was like, why not? What do you want to do? And she loves comic books. I love comic books. So we did this like comic book themed color goodness and at the end of it i was just like my kids were thrilled and i was thrilled and i put the pattern together for baby through adult because once i start knitting something for myself my kids immediately demand knitwear they're the most knit worthy though so it's it's worth it love that but yes yeah, so at the end of it i still felt like okay how many of this sweater can i knit a lot. I can knit a lot of them. I think I've knit like eight of them. And I still constantly find color combinations that I think, oh, that should be a soft arm sweater. But what I really wanted was to, people would come up to me while I was wearing my sweater or whenever I would go to an event and they'd say, that sweater is great. What else can I knit? I'd be like, well, that's a good question. And there really weren't that many resources for getting your incredible self-striping sock yarn out of your socks and like out in the world. So the whole point of the book was to write patterns that celebrated the self-striping yarn in a way that made it so that you could see it. I want you to see it. I want the special skeins that are like hiding in your stash because you didn't want to knit them into socks or like you, maybe you just need to change it up. I love to knit socks. Maybe you just want to knit something else, right? And so the book has hats and gloves and cowls and shawls and sweaters all in self-striping yarn. I was really like lucky to work with the independent dyers that I did because whenever you knit self-striping yarn, you get all of this color knowledge from the dyer. You know, like you find out all the magical things that they know about blue and you find out, oh, 
you can do that with pink. Like I had never thought of doing that with pink. And so there's just, they're a wealth of information and they're such talented dyers and like they needed to be celebrated. They just did in the book. So yeah, so that's where the book started. And I was approached by the publisher a little bit before Rhinebeck last year. So whenever I was at Rhinebeck last year, I was thinking, okay, am I going to say yes or no about this book? Like, is this something I could do? Always wanted to write a book. I asked several like friends that had written books, like, what did you think about the process and how did it go? And they were always like, it was so hard. <laughs> like I have one friend who told me it was like having a baby. And I think looking back on this year, I would say that that's pretty accurate. <laughs> so I started the book. It like my husband is extremely supportive. So actually in the spring, he needed to work on his dissertation and I was fully invested in the book. And then the pandemic happened and we did a full role reversal. He became the full-time parent. He started doing all the homeschooling and I just like threw myself into the book. I was working, the, the book has 25 patterns and I worked with like, it's, at one point I think I had 15 tests going and I was working with like a hundred different testers at the time. And so it was such a good growing experience because I didn't know what I was capable of before I started the book. And it was exhausting because like it was the pandemic and our, you know, it, the house had become a place where two adults were working and two kids were schooling and we were trying to do this big project. We had in our extreme confidence about what we do, my husband and I, because it's really a company that we built together we had pitched to the publisher that we wanted to do all the photography because we do all of our photography already. Like, sure, we can do all of the photography, no problem. So um, my husband is oh, over the years together, we've worked out a system where I try to complain not too much about being in front of the camera because I really don't enjoy it. And he tries to make like dirty jokes in the background so that I'll actually smile in pictures. And he takes the pictures and I do all the editing. So it seemed like a great pandemic and then the pandemic hit and we had to do all the photography for the book in our yard, basically. We built an outdoor photo studio because I wanted to work with models. I wanted to show the garments on different body types and make sure that you, know, you could understand like this can work for this person and this can work for this person. It could work for you. Like, the, and a lot of the patterns are easy to modify, which is super fun. So you need to really be able to show like the potential of the garment in the pictures, but we weren't, we needed to social distance while we were doing all of that. So yes, everything was built outside and the publisher was really flexible with that, which was really nice. And my husband was really flexible with that because of all the years of me being such a hard person to work with in front of the camera. <laughs> And actually it went beautifully and it was like eye-opening to work with models that weren't just me or my children. So your husband um, was excited to work with the other models. Oh, definitely. Because they complained so much less than me. The things that we do, so we would have a model come out and we're, we would estimate the time frame for how long we have six garments. We practiced everything. We're like, okay, we, we need to look like we have been DIYing this since the beginning. So we need to look like we do this all the time, right? They looked at the website, they had gotten, both of my models were wonderful. They like researched me to make sure that they knew what they were getting into. And so they came prepared. So I had put together like shot lists and we had been like screen testing garments for weeks. And so then we were just like, okay, we think six garments is gonna take us approximately three to four hours. That's what we're gonna hire you for. If that's not enough, we'll bring you back but we'll be exhausted at the end of four hours. There's no way we can do more than that. And then you'd get the models here and they were so confident in front of the camera. They could make like micro changes. Whereas I'm like flinging my hair around and like every other shot is me making a disgusted face at my husband. So the things that took us weeks to do for me took us just a few hours to do with the models. How did you so find your models? They were wonderful. So um, my husband, so two different ways. So my husband, he works um, with, so his PhD is in linguistics and he works with the Burmese refugee community around Indianapolis. And um, 
he, one of his colleagues, she was finishing up her degree and she, he went to like a cultural event for the Chin community and she was modeling at that event. He was like, no, my wife is going to be looking for models. Would you be interested? And she was really enthusiastic and she was wonderful. And then we needed another model. And I was so intimidated to start asking, like calling up modeling agencies. Anytime I do something new, I'm extremely intimidated by it. Um, and then I just like go in, like just pretend that you know what you're talking about. Say mm -hmm, a lot, smile, look serious. So I actually found our modeling agency through Instagram, this wonderful woman named Leslie. She, I had talked to several modeling agencies that were big companies or big parts of franchises and they just didn't understand what I was doing. And then I met Leslie, like we talked on the phone and she had started a boutique agency and she was one of the only agencies that had a plus size model that you know, like had, she had a great smile and she was just so warm in her photographs and she was willing, they were willing to meet me and like in person. And Leslie had grown her business from the ground up as a black modeling agency in Indianapolis. And she just got it. You know, she said, I remember like DIYing everything at the beginning too. I remember what that was like and making those transitions is important. And so I could be really honest with her about where I was at and she could be honest with me with what she needed. And it was such a great relationship. That's awesome. Yeah. Well, do you have anything you can show us? Oh, I'm anything? so sorry. I'm such a chatter. Um, yes. Yeah, so this is a really fun little hat. So it's knit as a reversible hat. And it was inspired by my youngest daughter who always wears two hats because apparently I don't knit hats thick enough. But this is like a really fun beginner pattern that just uses eyelets. Eyelets are a great way to break up stripes and you can see the colors through it, which is really fun. And it's so soft and squishy. This is um, Mud Punch. And she has this really heavy, like uh, fingering weight yarn that just, it's got so much squish. It's so good. Um, and then this is one of our, my bigger like dramatic, pieces. This is called, see if I can even show it all, the daring double. So you can see it's two triangles knit together. Well bound, so you through, do a three needle bind off to attach them. So it's two triangular shawls and turning those stripes on their side, which is such a fun way to get stripes that are really short and narrow for socks to work for really big garments. It's nice to be able to knit them vertically rather than knit them horizontally. Um, and this was just like, this is Bad Amy Knits and she does the most incredible gradient stripes. They're like start at this crazy purple and then move through all the colors. And you don't wanna put that inside of your shoes. Like you just, that needs to be celebrated. You know, like that work that went into that Oh, it's just so exciting. So there um, will be, there will be some sock arms, a little sock arm action in the book. Um, I've been, there have been lots of requests over the years since it came out to do a top down version. So there's a top down cardigan in the book, which I'm excited about. And then I have, this is a really fun project that's great for beginners. It's a cowl, I'll try it on. So I knit this using Valkyrie fibers and she does such great stuff with neutrals. I was talking about the things that you can learn from dyers with their co color knowledge. She combines neutrals in the most exciting ways with bright colors so that they, I feel like they just really shine. Tuck into the front of your sweat or front of your coat and the back of your coat. And the great thing about this. So first of all, the name of this self-striping is it was come. I, I was drunk. It was Comic-Con. It's like the best name ever. <laughs> and then I combined it with this color at the top, this tiniest umbrella. And this is a really great way to stretch a self-striping. So self-striping yarn is typically designed for socks. So something with a really narrow circumference, really narrow stripes. So in order to be able to put it on your neck or put it on your, even on your sleeves, sometimes you just need a trick. You need to be able to break it up. And so alternating between the self-striping and another color is a great way to make the stripes longer 
so that you can wear them basically anywhere on your body. That cowl almost looks plaid. It's really cool. It does, doesn't it? She is, this is like a lightly speckled yarn too. She just really is so, she is, I mean, she's really a wonderful color ins inspiration. I feel like whenever you start looking at her yarn, she's doing something really special. Um, but I, I could probably say that about every single design in the book. I'm like, oh, this is really special. Let me tell you why. <laughs> How many different dyers did you use in the book? Do you remember? I don't remember the exact number, but 15 maybe? It was and is quite there a, a few. It was, is there a source list in the book? Yes, there's a source list in the back of the book. It might even be more than 15 if you include, because there were several um, designs that I combined with other dyers. So like this beautiful self-striping from Mud Punch was combined with Lolo Did It hmm. in that Shaboom colorway, which like is my favorite colorway. I think I bought that colorway on four different bases now. Mm -hmm. Can't stop that's, myself. That's so cool. So now that you're almost through it, is this the hardest thing you'll ever do? Uh, I don't know. It was real hard. I had two nine pound plus babies. They were real hard. Um, <laughs> but maybe it's kind of like that joke, like having a third kid, you yell, you're drowning, and then somebody throws you a baby. And so it's a little bit like that. You have two kids and like somebody throws you a book. <laughs> that. So um, it was, a, it was, I think because of the pandemic, it was a little trickier, but also I don't know, the silver lining about that was, it was hard to be distracted by the pandemic a lot because I couldn't control what was happening in the world at large, but I could control the book. So I, you know, we spent, I threw a lot of time and energy and focus. And if I hadn't had that, this year might've been harder for me, but I'll never know. So what's the title of the book again? Did you say it already? Sorry, I haven't said it yet. It's Knit Happy with Self-Striping Yarn. And when is the release date? So it's coming out December 22nd and it's available, available for pre-order now. Um, so it's gonna be ready right before Christmas, which is a little Christmas gift for myself. I'm gonna be so excited that I can finally share everything with everyone. <laughs> and so underneath this video, we can link to your Ravelry page and links to pre-ordering the book and all of those yes. things, right? Yes, yes, definitely. Okay, so I will be putting that underneath here. And okay. uh, anything else you want to share, just let me know and I can just type it right in. Okay. Comments below. And I, this is so, it's so exciting. I can really feel your joy and your enthusiasm. And I've tried to teach people in it and it is really hard. So that is a really good takeaway for me and anyone else who wants to teach is start with the joy because look where it has led you. Yeah. Yeah, you've got to start everything with joy. I was just saying that to my my husband because we're homeschooling this year. It's a lot of work. I have all new respect for homeschooling families. So this year, it's just been like, you know, we're teaching my daughter to read and we're teaching my older daughter multiplication tables. And it's all, it's a lot about making sure you have balloons and making sure you incorporate some hopscotch. And like, there's got to be joy. Otherwise, why bother? Because they're going to stop. If you teach someone to knit and you don't have any joy, then they're never going to continue. They're never going to learn how to read a pattern and they're never going to think I could knit a sweater. You need to like, you need to find the joy like inside yourself and share it because our community is so full of that joy. I'm like, I don't know. It's a gift to share it with someone. Well, I had a lot of great takeaways from our chat today and I thank you so much for spending time here on Christy Glass Knits and I'm looking forward to seeing your book in its entirety. Well, thank you so much for having me. I'm such a fangirl, so I'm so glad that I got to meet you in person at Rhinebeck last year and then finally get to talk to you. So much fun. And I guess for now, until next time, we'll say bye. Yes, goodbye.